Hi everyone. Hey, uh, welcome to the second of our colloquium um, series speakers. Um, this uh, today we are extremely uh, excited to have with us Masahide Kato. Um, I've been uh, looking forward to um, having Masa talk since I met him last year. Uh, Masa taught the course after mine. We were sort of in the same classroom, and I always felt really self-conscious. After meeting him, he told me that he was teaching a class on hip-hop, and I was teaching a class on sort of Southeast Asian cultures. And I was like, oh, hip-hop sounds really cool. In Southeast Asian cultures, it sort of made me up my game a little bit to uh, be teaching before him, because he, he would sometimes be out there listening to me. So. Um, so I'm really excited actually to have him here, and uh, I wanted to just introduce him briefly. Uh, Masa has a master's in cultural anthropology uh, from uh, the University of the University of University of Hiroshima, and a master's and a PhD in uh, political science here at the University of Hawaii. Um, he's interested in the role of culture in social transformation and in cultural politics, and in looking at how popular culture becomes a place for uh, a change of political consciousness. Um, and he's very interested in, as I think we'll see in today's talk, in ecological co consciousness and alternative meanings of sovereignty. Um, much of his work looks at uh, Hawaii, but when I was talking to him about sort of uh, the broad themes of his work, one thing he said that cuts through all of the work he does is attention to, uh, to sampling aesthetics, this idea of reassembling the past in newly relevant ways. Uh, and um, so. Uh, I hope that you'll join me in welcoming Masa to uh, to the Anthropology Colloquium Series. Thanks. Thank you. I'm honored to be here in Anthropology Colloquium. Uh, like, and mahalo to Jonathan, Professor Johnson Padway, for inviting me to this colloquium. I feel like I'm at home because this is where I started when I landed at UH. And uh, I had a mentor who is still a mentor, uh, Dr. Stephen Box. And actually, this whole research started with my conversation with Dr. Boggs at the Yonan Palace. I finished my manuscript from Kung Fu to Hip Hop, and I wanted to continue the, the research of graffiti. And back in 2006, this AF crew that we're going to talk about was really prolific in Kareohe, Kaharu area. So he suggested, why don't you do this research? So I took up the task and came up with this uh, the research. So I want to share that with you. So first, um, I want to talk about the emergence of graffiti uh, in a post-industrial uh, biopolitical context. Uh, graffiti came, emerged in late 60s to 70s in the East Coast United States when there was a major biopolitical changes uh, taking place. Uh, biopolitics, um, I'm actually uh, citing Michel Foucault's notion of biopolitics, which is basically the political intervention on the level of uh, uh, species, uh, the human beings as a species. So, what involves, macro politically speaking, is a transformation of transportation system. The way it circulates the population, the way it circulates the, the goods, uh, uh, the way it circulates the information. And so in the case of New York City, they created a suburban centric uh, transportation system where uh, people, uh, basically white collar, can migrate to uh, suburbs and they can commute to the center. And all those highway networks was built to facilitate this suburban migration. And uh, also the manufacturing plants migrated from the urban core to the suburbs before they went to the foreign countries. So those are the biopolitical changes in the macro level. In the micro level, it involves uh, changes of the, uh, the, the family. So you have, uh, like for instance, Bronx, uh, it's totally abandoned. So there's no uh, sort of welfare for them, for the, the people in the ghetto. So um, Essentially, the family structure is broken, and, and also the uh, available jobs or service industry. So women basically getting those service jobs, men are un unemployed, so they lack this uh, emotional labor. So therefore, the, the youth had to find alternative family, and that turned into a gang, and then that evolved into hip-hop. So along this path, there's always graffiti. So graffiti is something that's responding to this radical, drastic, biopolitical changes in the, post, uh, in the era of post-industrialism. And I also use this uh, notion of ecology, uh, which is based on Felix Gattari's uh, three ecologies. So he would uh, define three ecologies as a social ecology, uh, and natural ecology, of course, and the mental ecology, or existential ecology, which has to do with the subjectivity. 
So for instance, in terms of social ecology, he talks about how um, uh, the real estate um, industry is taking over the uh, New York City. So uh, people like, um, what is his name, the, the beauty contest guy? Uh, Trump, yeah, Donald Trump. Okay. So he, he, he analogizes drunk, drunk Donald Trump as a sort of a mutated allergy that takes over the bio system. So what you have is those dead fish, which is basically the houseless people. So he's talking about the social structure of post-industrialism as a social ecology. And then the last element is a mental and existential ecology, which has to do with the subjectivity. And I'm applying this concept to analyze the aesthetic and semiotic ecology. So in the post-industrial landscape, we are surrounded by this infrastructure, which has basically the industrial uh, primer. And we are reproducing ourselves by looking at those walls in the school, in the highway. Uh, we, we, our subjectivity is actually surrounded by, the production of subjectivity is surrounded by this industrial uh, landscape. So when graffiti artists came to alter the surface, it actually changed the ecology. They're creating alternative ecology to the industrial, post-industrial biopolitics. So those two things are the basic uh, theoretical framework I use uh, for this research. But when I started, actually started to take pictures like this, I have to change the whole analytical framework. Because uh, for one thing, in Hawaii, the biopolitics is different from, for instance, the New York City. Uh, because there's a strong presence of indigenous people. Uh, so any biopolitical changes, drastic biopolitical changes, are uh, constantly contested by the indigenous people and the local people. So it, it's, it's, uh, we need to kind of have a different frame to understand the biopolitical changes in Hawaii. And especially um, since the indigenous culture is very strong, uh, we have to pay attention to the roots of graffiti in the indigenous culture, in this case, uh, people have petroglyph. So, um, I have to change my approach from uh, the conventional author-oriented, writer-oriented, autor uh, research to writing-oriented. So instead of following the, uh, the graffiti writers, I actually chase those writings and how this interact with the milieu, which is uh, uh, the environment, but also uh, the hot spots. Uh, for example, if you have graffiti on the state property and federal property, there will be more prize for the writers because you're actually challenging this uh, authority, the sovereign authority. So therefore, there's more risk in uh, putting graffiti on those spaces like uh, federal property, state property. And then, oh, I talk about this, but um, those AF crew, predominantly of Kanaka Maori, they are conscious of the, the space. So, the, so towards the end, I talk about how they dropped the graffiti on the crown lands, or so-called seeded lands, the contested space. So they're actually creating those uh, symbolic layers of meaning. Uh, so instead of focusing the author, I focus on the writing and how that interacts with the medium, the environment. And uh, I had actually a few informants who are not part of this F crew. Uh, they're actually Kanaka Maori writers, but they gave me the basic ideas what the graffiti is about. But I intentionally didn't talk to the F crew because I wanted to keep it enigmatic and uh, anonymous. And as I follow this sort of kipohaku approach, because kipohaku is not, the, the author is not exposing themselves. It's just a writing, a piece of writing on the, the piece of rock. So I decided to use this approach. And then by using this approach, I began to see the connection between how I style graffiti and the uh, original uh, notion of ecology, sovereignty, and law. So let me uh, start flipping the. Uh, slides. So for instance, this towel, I use this for the hip-hop class, the, uh, the picture in the syllabus. As you can see, this is F. Cruz Avalon. As you can see, you can see the Kolao Mountain. So in the case of Hawaii, it's not just ruining the industrial landscape, but they're actually giving alternatives based on the indigenous cultural body, in this case, uh, Arohaina, Maramaaina, uh, at the base of the, um, their signification. So we need to um, pay attention to sort of a locality, the specific locality of Hawaii and how that interacts with the art of graffiti or graffiti aesthetics. So in 2007, there was this uh, law passed, uh, summertime, it's anti-graffiti law, 
which uh, put the harsher sentences on the graffiti offenders. And they put the community service to actually erase what they've put up. So this was uh, 2007, a summer. So you can see how they actually did a crew name rather than individual name, because this is uh, uh, logistically uh, easier, faster. So you don't have to be detected by law enforcement officers or community organization, anti-graffiti community organization. So then, but then, um, November 2007, AF came up with this humongous uh, piece on uh, King Street, uh, top of the uh, Vietnamese restaurant. And this coincided with the uh, passing of the Act Two. Uh, I wonder if you remember 2007, it was the Hawaii Super Ferry. So the uh, state passed this law to make exemption for the Hawaii Super Ferry. And while they are actually, the state is designating or declaring the graffiti as illegal and putting harsher sentences, state is actually violating its own law, specifically environmental law. So this was sort of a statement that they were using the crew name, but they came up with a uh, large piece to sort of make a statement, uh, graffiti as absolute faith, AF as absolute faith. So you can see the sort of, sort of hot spot in terms of timing. So they have this certain timing to put up uh, as a message. Uh, the, the writing has a message to, to the people, uh, to the public. So um, this is a hot spot in terms of the um, timing. And then um, the, the same summer they passed the law, uh, the Kauai people were protesting against the, uh, the high super ferry. So the surfers and swimmers and paddlers went into the ocean and blocked the high super ferry. Uh, the reason for doing that is because they, are, uh, they wanted to uh, protect the in endangered mammals from the uh, invasive species. So it's an ecological concerns that express. So their sort of defiance against the law somehow linked to the uh, ecological concern of the people of Kauai and other people in Hawaii uh, over the Hawaii Super Ferry's introduction. And as it turned out, the Hawaii Super Ferry was an actually disguised military project. So they were testing the the high super ferry, and also they wanted to use that for uh, the transportation striker brigade. So the Kauai people sensed it, and probably it's the writing sense that sort of contradiction that was happening at the time. Now, moving on with this, another hot spot. Uh, well, after this, uh, this is uh, um, 2008, the individual pieces start coming up instead of the uh, 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 the crew pieces. So this is, um, again, the hot spot. So Spire, this is F crew, he was uh, starting out in 2006. And he had this, uh, his um, tag uh, painted on the Kanohe post office. So this becomes a prize. So you have a wanted you know, notice with a graffiti on it. It's not a person. Graffiti is a fact. So you can see that uh, they're actually going after, the writing is going after the hot spot. And this came out um, 2007, February. And this is F crew throw up with a Spire's tag on it. So most likely Spire did it on behalf of AF. And H3 Highway, this is the, the sign over the uh, Kamehameha Highway, right before the Pali Highway. And as you know, the, the H3 is a hot spot too, because that's a uh, backbone of the global uh, military force. The, uh, and also, uh, it's based on the desecration of the heals, especially on the uh, remote side. So by doing so, they're desecrating the desecration. So there's a the deeper meaning generated by just putting up this really risky, actually, uh, spot. You have to climb up to on top of the highway to go over there and step on this to uh, actually leave the pieces. So uh, it's a hot spot. And also, the symbolic meaning gets deeper. Now. This is another example of the uh, hot spot. Is, uh, this is when I was teaching a wine extension. This is Naval Station Pearl Harbor in Duolale. And you see those tagging happening. And the thing is, they don't touch, the writing doesn't appear in other uh, signs like this in Wine Coast. This is the only one the tag appears. And it keeps happening. So this is the, uh, um, 2009 and 2010. It's a different tag but they're actually targeting this hot spot because it's a military spot. So you have a prize again. 
and at the same time generate political meaning uh, by, in choosing, by choosing the uh, hot spot. So this is 2008. Uh, the graffiti went to the heart of judicial district. So they have this one tag on the uh, vineyard and Queen Emma. And then you have a lunch wagon in the corner of Beltania and Arakea. And then way down on Arakea Street and King Street, you have those graffiti along this way. So basically, this is a power line of judicial uh, uh, business complex in the downtown area. And uh, the center of that is, of course, the uh, um, district court, Honolulu district court. So this is on the vineyard, Queen Emma, um, Clito, and Farrell from AF. Uh, they had their throw up. And then Spire had this lunch wagon parked at the corner of vineyard, I'm sorry, yeah, Bertania and Alakea, across from the probation office. And he kept putting this, he or she or it, kept putting this uh, graffiti constantly to remind them that they are there. Then the Spire's auto eagle, Sir, appeared on the, uh, the American Savings Bank. It's on the Alakea Street. So it's a sticker, but if you know Spire, you know Sir. So they're actually sending a message. They're actually marking their turf. Uh, so that, that's a third piece um, in a different uh, location. So then rather sort of toyish uh, graffiti haze happened on Alakea and King Street. And uh, fast, yeah, another sort of, uh, not a high quality graffiti, but you can see they're actually taking over the whole Arakea Street. And the message is, to me, is they're actually challenging this notion of law, legality, and sovereignty. And the thing is, the district court is actually named after Kauke Aoori, uh, King Kamehameha III, who proclaimed Uamau Ke Aokaina Ikapono in 1843 against the European definition of sovereignty. So the life of the land is perpetuated in, uh, in the perfect balance. So in a way, it's a perfect tribute to Kawike Aoi or the, that notion of sovereignty. Sovereignty is not about the power over life and death. In the Western sovereign tradition, it tends to turn into sovereign right to kill. So it becomes a contestation between who can kill most. That's what's happening in the Middle East. It's a contestation of the sovereign, sovereign power uh, in the Western sense, but it's happening in the Middle East. But in Hawaii, the sovereign power is to save life. So uh, the air, the part, is the life force. So therefore, to me, uh, this is the perfect tribute to the Hawaiian definition of sovereignty. Now, we get into the Hawaiian style graffiti. Uh, those water tanks become sort of gallery of lesser known writers. So they start from here. And then you see uh, actually indigenous theme in those water tanks. And particularly this water tank uh, is a hot spot too, because this is a behind the uh, Kola Golf Course. And it's, I, I did a research, this is actually a private water tank. This is not for the bottle of water supply. So they're actually taking the water, natural resources, to replenish the fairway of the golf course and basically use it for their uh, church and banquet facility. So of course, the indigenous-based uh, uh, themed uh, graffiti shop created natives, uh, and this indigenous-based sort of a design uh, is on the water tank. And also, the water tank is where you have to hike up. So in a way, you actually engage in the Aloha Aina. You're in the Aina condition, and you actually marking uh, your aesthetic message on the water tank. So uh, in that sense, too, it's actually uh, sort of Similar to Kipohaku, you go into the wilderness and drop the, uh, uh, the Kipohaku, you actually painting the graffiti. So now, um, so I get into the genealogy of graf uh, Hawaiian style graffiti. One is um, hip hop missionary. Phase two came here to educate uh, the youth in early 80s about hip hop. So. His disciple, this, he's from New York. He's uh, one of the pioneers in white style. And his disciple, East Three, was the pioneer, one of the pioneers, graffiti writer on Oahu. So you have a genealogy back to New York, wild style. That's one genealogy. And also, um, subway art. If you go to any library, this book is gone. It's not there anymore. <laughs> so it's, it's, and everyone take it, and they actually use this to learn about the wild style. So that's one genealogy. But the other genealogy I found 
this is uh, the conversation I was having with my uh, spouse. She said, well, if you're going to do graffiti research, you got to look into the petroglyphs. There's no way around it. So I checked the, uh, the book called The uh, Hawaiian Petroglyphs, and you see those letters. And between 1820s and 1860s, they had those letters alongside the symbol. Uh, 1820s, when the, f uh, the first missionary came, first contingent of missionary came, uh, they had a printer. So they start printing those letters to uh, basically educate uh, the native people how to uh, how to write how to read their own language. So interestingly, um, they first had, according to Albert Schultz, they first had a school for Ali, but they switched to uh, commoners, the Makainana. What happened was that they start sharing their knowledge to everybody. So you know the the Han Kingdom had the, like really nine, over ninety percent literacy rate one of the uh, highest literacy rate in the world, is because people are actually enjoying uh, teaching the fonts. So they took the fonts from missionary and they start playing around. This other one is probably close to the original font. But you can see the, this oke kahiko, which means the, of the old, you see the slight uh, sort of disfiguration of the, uh, the, the, the letters, uh, slight distortion that you can see. So. When you look at the um, Fido, his piece, you can definitely see the two genealogies. One is Wildstar in New York. The other is actually the Petroglyph letters. And those things probably are not conscious in the writers. But then I think it's the writing takes you to that sort of consciousness, the space, sort of quantum space where the present, past, and future all mingle together. So that's what the graffiti does. Uh, it's a quantum consciousness. And Fido, which means actually um, in the phytogenesis means plant and vegetation. So basically when he uh, put up those graffiti, he's contributing to the sustainability. He's actually reforesting the natural landscape. And this is called, um, in the Hawaiian tradition, uh, by contrast to this, this is the LA graffiti writer. Uh, so you can see the totally different um, style. You don't even see the letters, but Hawaiian style According to one of the Kanaka Maori writers, it's actually Hawaiian style stick to the letters. So the fighters, um, the hidden meaning is, this is from the uh, Noinoi Silva's uh, Allah Betrayed. The word kana means hidden meaning as in Hawaiian poetry, concealed reference as to the person, thing, or place, words with double meanings. An awareness of the political functions of kana, especially the possibilities for veiled communication helps you analyze the words and actions of the Kana Kamari. So Faito is basically living this tradition of Kana. So you can see, start to see the indigenous roots in the Hawaiian style graffiti. And also this one, um, this is an undisclosed location, Makaha. This is an actual Kipohaku, not the letter Kipohaku, but the symbol Kipohaku. And um, this, but you see this is a bruised surface. But if you look closely to the surface, it's actually a, a colony of microorganisms. So you have this life living in this space. So when Phyto pays tribute to the uh, reforestation and vegetation, it's actually he's, uh, paying tribute to the original ecology, which is to uh, give space to all the life forms, uh, saving lives. So this is the sort of principle that runs through the original Hawaiian ecology and sovereignty. It's about honoring life. So when you have this Kipohaku, the life living here, and that's the one that's actually seen. So you can see how the contemporary graffiti is a, a petrochemical alteration of the surface, but this is a biochemical alteration of the surface. So you can see the uh, genealogy um, to the Hawaiian graffiti. Well, this is um, sort of kind of a little sidetrack from the, uh, uh, the Hawaiian style, but. Um, in 2009, there was this furrow uh, happened. So as you can see, the graffiti got really big because they had more time to actually do elaborate pieces. Because <laughs> they didn't have those police in force. They're just, you know, the budget cut furrows. So they really didn't care. The state didn't care. The city didn't care. So you have those huge pieces that started to appear around 2009. And the Fido's piece became really elaborate, uh, really colorful and Hannibalesque thing. In, uh, uh, in the 2009 piece. So then 2010, there's a new anti-graffiti law. Uh, it's a site-based punishment. So offenders will be responsible for the removal of any graffiti 
that will be painted within 100 yards of the original graffiti location for two years. So it's almost like public defender uh, actually uh, made a testimony. It's like giving some people a ticket for other people speeding on the same spot. So basically, this is a categorical punishment for the graffiti writers. But then, writers didn't um, stay back. They went. Actually, this is a 2011. Um, when they announced the APEC conference, uh, you start to see this is right across from the convention center. So immediately after the announcement, they're going to have an APEC at the convention center. We start to see news and uh, Clito uh, from the AF. So those are the sort of responses to the biopolitical changes. And also, um, this is uh, actually um, Hawk Child, which means Kamapua. His piece of Kamehameha appeared around the same time. So in a way, symbolically, he's actually alluding to the, the law of spin the paddle, uh, Kamehameha's law, which basically um, protects the safety of the passage, freedom of movement, and especially for uh, elders and children, they can sleep by the side of the boat. But APEC was a total violation of this not just the US Constitution, but you're talking about the Kanabai, uh, Mamara Hoe. So in a way, you can see, again, they are referring to this original sovereignty, original law, uh, original ecology, uh, by using their sort of signification and their semiotics. Now, 2012, this is I'm winding up my uh, field work. And uh, it's been kind of, you know, for six years, so I decided, to, let's put the closure to this. <laughs> So um, then I saw this idol um, piece, and you can see copyright. So he's from, <laughs> this writer is from Kauai, and he's uh, doing graffiti for the, the corporate, you know, uh, basically the uh, clients. So this one is from Harry Davidson. So he would do it for um, artists like uh, um, Snoop Dogg, uh, all those famous artists. So his video kind of corporate. Uh, graffiti writer. And as you can see, it's a copyright. So this is the graffiti in the age of intellectual property rights. So he's protecting his aesthetic expression with the copyright. So that's so one, one notion of how graffiti merged into the property, notion of property. But then I just moved on. This is uh, close to the airport, uh, Mapunapuna area. So from Mapunapuna to airport, I um, trekked on and I find Fido. So, oh, fire is here. And this is in a military golf course. And there's a little um, corner where you have an old military equipment, broken equipment, and uh, it's sort of like, um, it, it's kind of like a dead zone in the golf course. But you see this fire, and then I look at it, and what happened to O? Maybe he was too busy that he couldn't put the O. But then, oh, I'm sorry. But then, actually, there is no O. And can you pronounce this? Fire, exactly. So this is a hot spot. It's a really hot spot. It's across from the international airport. It's in a military golf course. And this is on the Crown land. So this is basically provoking this international dispute about the Hawaiian sovereignty, uh, the Hawaiian law, Hawaiian ecology. So this, this was my last. Um, sort of reservation of the, the graffiti, and that ended my research. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. I have a little question. I noticed that the whole time you used um, the word writers to refer to all the graffiti people, and every um, other time I've you know, uh, heard people talk about graffiti or studied it or whatever. I've heard them call artists. So I was wondering what your uh, reason was for that. Well, that's a good question. Because yeah. um, um, definitely, the search, some writers identify themselves as artists. So you see those moral arts happening in Kakaako. And definitely, they are artistic approach. But some hardcore writers, they consider themselves as bundle. They are bundle forever. So their purpose is not to. Why well, is to make artistic expression, but they are actually manifesting something else, which is criminalized in, in our society. Uh, for instance, Lady Pink, uh, she's uh, from New York. Uh, she's Puerto Rican, one of the first uh, female writers from New York. 
uh, she basically is saying that you, know, you have to be ready to be a bundle. It's a criminal activity. So the, the, you know, two types of people, right? the, the people who actually, the IRO, the, who did a, a piece on a, a Harvey, De Harvey Davidson, he's definitely an artist. But other people, like for instance, my informant, um, he was active and he took a break. But he came back because he saw uh, all those sort of vandal graffiti and uh, really going down quality wise, but he have those murals going up quality wise. So he saw the balance and as a writer, he has to go back to the front line. Put the really fine pieces out there. Uh, that's the writer's identity. So yeah, there are different versions. They sometimes mix in one person, but there are you know groups of people that have different relationships. I want to ask you a question about uh, the tendency for people who will um, tag their Twitter handle or other identifying information in graffiti. I've seen that happen occasionally. Wait, what is Twitter handle? They'll tag their identity so you can put them in the internet. Oh. Call them on the internet. So I was wondering what was up with that, whether oh, people yes. are now trying to use that to build some kind of like reputation, even though they might still be anonymous. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Yeah, definitely internet becomes another space that they can actually uh, put up their pieces, uh, they can put the information. Or in Australian case, uh, they have this community watchers. They actually have this uh, Wanjina graffiti, which is based on the Wanjina figure of the traditional Australian Aboriginal art. And that turned into graffiti. So people actually bystanders take pictures and share on the internet. So definitely, the internet is a new sort of space that they can actually, uh, uh, you know, archive the graffiti or get the reputation. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, no doubt. Yes. Um, you talked a little bit about petroglyphs and made it sound as though this is a tradition of graffiti that's descended from that. Uh, do you think that the, you know, the pre-contact, putting that in quotes, did that? Did those such lists have different functions in this graffiti? I, I'm guessing they do. Uh, what would you say about right. the function of the petroglyphs? Yeah, I think it's the petroglyph, I mean, when you read those books, they can't really come to this decisive conclusion what this means. They can actually guess, like, uh, you know, analyzing the environment, the historical time, other archaeological uh, evidences. So they come up with those messages that's actually in there. So for instance, uh, the petroglyph I showed you, um, it's according to a um, cultural um, practitioner who's actually uh, um, the secretary of the LCC Wildlife Extension. Uh, it's referring to the Ku Iriuloa Heao, or Kane Iriuloa used to be called Kane Iriola. So this is sort of like a marking the triangular uh, hot spots in a traditional sense. So in a hot spot in a traditional sense, you have a mana in one spot. But then you have another spot, and you make those triangular connections to actually connect the mana. So that's, to me, the sort of you know, traditional type of uh, uh, meaning, which is different from the, the graffiti. But, but then there, you, you see that sort of uh, site consciousness, how they are actually conscious about the site they're putting up, is definitely a correlation or genealogy back to the uh, original meaning of uh, generation. Yes? How did you come to like start doing graffiti? Like, how did you start doing other than like being introduced to it? Or like, have you ever, like before being introduced to it, have you ever thought, oh, that's interesting, and then made a connection yourself? Like, oh. Like, the art things? Yeah, I started with, um, because my book uh, started from dissertation, but had this chapter on hip hop. And I was an academic writer, I was attracted to the writing. And um, so I started to sort of use graffiti as an example of uh, decolonization. So in a book, I juxtapose um, this Chinese writer, I can't remember his name, he's from Hong Kong. But what he does is he's marking his uh, genealogy on the public property, basically saying that. I'm the descendant of the king who used to own this place. So I look at it, wow, this is interesting. It's, it's slightly different from the New York wild style. But still yet, the, um, this long graffiti writer, I guess, in the Hong Kong style, is basically manifesting something that's already there, but nobody recognizes it. 
So the similar thing happens with this uh, Hawaii style graffiti. It's, it's a mana spa or a controversy or contested space, but something is there. So they're actually marking that spot and letting people know there's something over here. You, you, you might want to think about this. So in that sense, yeah, they, they made a connection uh, between the Hong Kong graffiti and the uh, New York graffiti and the Hawaii style graffiti. Did I answer the question? Yeah. But um, yeah, so yeah, that's that was the beginning. But the tr transformation happened when, like I said, my spouse said, "You have to dig into the petroleum. They didn't know where I run. When that changed the whole perspective on the graffiti in Hawaii, because I was doing, I was taking this author-oriented approach. Uh, that it, it wasn't, it wasn't happening. So I had to shift it to a more topo topographical, archaeological. Um, based, uh, like kind of keep on doing research. And then I start to see a lot of deeper meanings. And that's one of the things I avoided because I actually talked to some of the uh, AF crew, but I kept my conversation minimum because I didn't want to, like, it didn't, I didn't want to turn this into, yeah, I did that. I had this intention to do it. But that's sort of like um, reading, you know, Garcia Marquez's book and asking Garcia Marquez, did you mean this? And it's kind of like really reduce the power of the text, because the text has its own life. So I want to let the text have its own life. So I will chase that life that's going on. Instead of, you know, referring back to the author, I want to see how this writing will take me. It took me to this, to Nakaha. And <laughs> like I said, I had this really, like, you know, really strange space for the uh, past and present and future, just like, in my brain and my existence and what I can say is a quantum experience I have. <laughs> and that's probably what the you know learning about indigenous culture, indigenous art does is to connect, you know, because the Hawaiian notion of time is uh, you look, look in front and just in front, Mamua is the past, Mahope is the future. So you always uh, look to the past to get the guidance to go to the future. And hip hop is the same thing. Because we sample stuff and we sample from the past. We arrange it in the present time, so it becomes this futuristic sort of effect. So, yeah, I think that's to me the, the coming back to introduction is the new consciousness we need to cultivate because that's where we can actually get united. When you see the Middle East uh, situation, it's really depressing. There's no way out. I mean, we need some new consciousness, and uh, I think this is one of them. We can, this can help us go to the space where we can all be together. And there's no difference. There may be difference, but the difference doesn't, you know, evolve the relationship. And you know, we can actually be in uh, multiple spaces at the same time. Consciousness wise. Or maybe physically. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yes. Uh, so you followed the, the group uh, AF mm -hmm. and uh, there must be other groups in Hawaii. I was, oh, yeah. I was just gonna ask you if like they also followed like the symbolic things that AF they follow. Right, yeah. Uh, I have uh, the UK. Um, UK, I don't know what it's, the UK stands for, but they were, in the beginning, was basically going over AF. So they had this sort of gang warfare happening. But then after a while, I think they started doing their own thing, and their quality got better. You can see uh, UK's graffiti, like the Kiliki Highway, uh, underneath the, uh, the airport viaduct, you know, the Nimitz Highway. Um, but I haven't really studied the you know, symbolic meaning of them. But the thing is that F crew, they are conscious because they are composed mostly Kanakama Army. Uh, so as you can see, when you look at their site and timing and you know, the, the, the meaning that they're trying to generate, they are really conscious about their identity as a business uh, people. So. Yes? Martin, can I ask you, uh, since I'm sort of really intrigued um, by your focus on, on text and your, your, your interest in, in keeping distance from the subjects of your study. I mean, you've, you've said, no, that's not the subject. The subject is the text in the places where it, where it is and, and the meanings that it produces by being there. Um, and I, so I wondered with this approach to research, sort of how, how do you know that they have crew is composed of Kanaka Maoli. How do you know that um, this, the, for instance, um, when they're tagging on federal property, 
that it has a higher value to them, or, it, or, or are these things that can be inferred in the text itself? Where does that kind of um, understanding come from? Well, I have a contact with the F crew, uh, but then it was a minimal contact. So I was able to ascertain their identity, Kagamari identity. And they, they actually put that in front. And, um, and over the years, uh, like Hope Child, you've seen, um, the Kamehameha's uh, the figure. They are really getting really conscious about their identity. So Hawk Child has all those water tank uh, series, and they're all based on the uh, uh, traditional figures, like Makabaru, uh, Io, uh, I didn't bring it with me, but they're, they're really becoming conscious of this the sort of high end roots. So um, yeah, it's in the text, but also I had an informant who's Kanaka Maori. They, they know those guys, so they can actually give me information. But, I really didn't want to, especially if I, I, want to, I wanted to leave him out. If I talked to him, this whole thing would be shrunk to this one dimension. So I wanted to let the text speak and then let the whole context speak. Uh, so treat Fido's pieces as a you know, the piece of writing, as uh, it should be. So, <laughs> yeah, that's my approach. Did that answer the question? It does. So yes. when you were doing the work, did you just like wander around the city with the camera and try to find the art, or how did that work? Oh yeah, that was there. So 2006 when I started, um, I was practically doing a house husband. So I was living in Kanoe, so I took my baby in the baby car, go to Fimo Mall. That's what the reality was. And that's the air crew. So wow, this is fascinating, because I was studying this New York Wild style. This is comparable to the New York Wild style, it's high quality. So I started taking pictures, and so I start taking my daughter to different places <laughs> and take pictures. And also, those days I was doing a court interpreter in the court system. So they sent me to, uh, uh, you know, the whole district court, to uh, Eva court, to uh, Kaneohe, to all over the place. So, you know, the bus or driving, I see those things. So I went back Sunday and take pictures. So that's how it happened. And then I had an informant. That, that, that's the thing, because this is an anthropology class, so I want to share this. Um, I was in a, the hip hop crew from 2004. So I was surrounded by people who are actually writers, who are beat makers, and who are actually engaged in the hip hop. So my interview with hip hop crew are based on the informal interview. The reason why is because I tried to do the formal interview. So let's sit down, okay? And I start reading the question. And all of a sudden, ethnographic authority appears between us. It became really constrained, so I forget this. We're not going to do this formal interview, so I just chat with them, hang it out, and get the information, I write it down on notes, and that's how I did it with the you know, graffiti writers. A basic, basic understanding of graffiti and hip hop came from the informal conversation. The formal conversation was with uh, anti graffiti community uh, organizers or the legislators who passed these anti graffiti uh, bills. So I made an appointment and uh, I did a formal interview with them. But mostly, and also um, by suggestion by some of the faculty over here, why don't you talk to the people, like people who are actually affected by the graffiti? So I started talking to those shop owners, and it was kind of scary because they're really mad. So you know they they use those violent language to express their anger. But that was really good that you can see the totality of what's happening with graffiti. Or bystanders are you know the high school. Um, Students just walking by and ask them, "What do you think about graffiti?" You know, and they say, "Wow, that's beautiful," but I don't like that one, like junk ad. So I get the whole sort of, you know, uh, rounds of perspective of the graffiti. Um, so I was able to see the whole phenomenon, not just the writers and writing, but the how people react. Even though it's not in the research, but I think it was really important that I talk to those people who are affected or who are bystanders and. I think that's maybe you know you can use for your ethnography. You just talk to the people, whoever that is. You don't confine to the target audience, but you know, go we'll talk to a lot of people. And it was really fun. And then that gave me a basis to actually teach cultural anthropology in wider extension. And we had great fun uh, going to different places and talking to people and writing this you know, participant observation, ethnography, and stuff like that. So. <laughs> Yes. So maybe another question. Um, I know in some places on the East Coast, like in, um, I'm from Rhode Island, so I know in Providence, the justification for uh, taking down graffiti is because they're like tags of 
of gangs that are actually violent, you know, like even gun fights in the street and stuff, so it's like an anti-violence thing. But here I'm wondering about the justification, is it purely ecological and then is that playing into this dialogue, this right dialogue that you're talking so about? So you mean the, the buffing activities, the erasing activities? Yeah, what is yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So yeah, I did an interview uh, with those community organizers, and their concern is the property. Yeah. So they don't want this to be uh, putting down the property value. So um, that's their main concern. So they don't really care about the, so I had to ask them, what about those, you know, maybe if those are high school kids, they don't have any outlet to express themselves, so this is the only outlet that they can express, and they, they didn't really care. They're really fixated on the protection of property. And that's, Reflection on societies, property-based society. So, uh, like for instance, APEC, uh, APEC conference happens, they wipe out all the graffiti and houseless people. They get rid of those people because temporarily that's a transnational uh, corporate property. So they, you know, they have national guards and police force 24/7. So it definitely, um, to me, even those um, graffiti that's not aesthetically pleasing, they are actually challenging that sort of property-based society. So what kind of society is it? Like you don't even care about the youth, but you care about the property. So that's the kind of message we, t we need to take in to restructure society. So it it's definitely the, the writing on the wall. <laughs> yeah. um, that sounds like a great note to just uh, take a break from the formal uh, talk and go outside and uh, have some poo-poos and oh, wow. uh, continue the conversation. Um, but before we do, I just want to thank you, Masa, for thank coming. You. Thanks very much.